Lee Edwards is the Distinguished Fellow in Conservative Thought at the Heritage Foundation, and he's, been, he's a leading historian of American conservatism and an author of 25 books. His books include biographies of Ronald Reagan, Barry Goldwater, Bill Buckley, and Ed Meese, as well as histories of the Cold War, the Heritage Foundation, and the American conservative movement. He's also an adjunct professor of, at the Catholic University of America, a founding director of, of the Institute of Political Journalism at Georgetown University, and he's been a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. In his early career, he was, the he was one of the founding members of the Young Americans for Freedom and director of information for the Goldwater Campaign and director of PR for Nixon Agnew 1968. He has contributed to several publications and has worked as a consultant for several politicians, including the Nixon administration. Mr. Edward has a really interesting history. His father, Willard, was a newspaper columnist for the Chicago Tribune for nearly 50 years and was an eyewitness to many of the seminal moments of throughout Richard Nixon's career. You'll hear about this in this talk. He's also the author of a new memoir about his life in the conservative movement, Just Right, A Life in the Pursuit of Liberty, which he'll gladly sign after this talk tonight. On another note, in November 1969, near the end of Nixon's first year in office, uh, the New York Times called Mr. Edwards the voice of the silent majority. And again, you'll find out why in this talk. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Mr. Lee Edwards. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a beautiful evening in Yorba Linda and a great day to be alive. And it's wonderful to be able to come and talk to you for a little bit this evening about some of the seminal figures in the conservative movement of America. People like Barry Goldwater, uh, Ronald Reagan, um, William F. Buckley Jr., and and Richard Nixon, although he's not generally considered to be a conservative, I'll try to make an argument about where, in fact, he did some very conservative things uh, when he was president. Now, Barry Goldwater, some of you may have voted for him in 1964. See a few gray hairs out there. <clears throat> I think it can be fairly said that Barry Goldwater sparked the conservative revolution in America. But you know, he was a most unlikely revolutionary. <clears throat> he was the grandson of a Jewish peddler who came over from Poland and made his way down to Phoenix. He was a college dropout whose book, The Conscience of a Conservative, sold 3.5 million copies. Oh, if only that could happen to me. <laughs> I'll, t I'll take 100,000. <laughs> he never smoked a cigarette or drank a cup of coffee in his life, but he kept a bottle of Old Crow in the refrigerator of his Senate office for after five sipping. Delighted in challenging conventional wisdom, but always with the Constitution as his guide. Politics is filled with what ifs, as we know. But if Goldwater had been elected president in 1964, we can be certain of two things and consider this. The Vietnam War would have been won in 12 months or President Goldwater would have brought the troops home. He took his lead from both uh, General MacArthur and uh, General Eisenhower who said, don't ever get involved in a land war in Asia. 58,000 Americans would not have died in a war that never had victory as its goal. Here at home, we would not have embarked on that trillion dollar experiment in welfareism known as the Great Society. And it is now something like almost $10 trillion have been spent on welfare programs since 1965. Uh, Barry Goldwater was a very reluctant champion. 
um, conservatives, including me, went all out to draft him. So therefore, for most of 1963, I served the National Draft Goldwater Committee as a volunteer press assistant, and was then hired as its news director in November of 1963. My first day on the job was scheduled to be Monday, November 25th, 1963. Mark that date, November 25th, 1963. On Friday, November 22nd, I was having lunch in the Capitol Hilton Hotel when the news struck Washington like an earthquake. President John F. Kennedy had been assassinated in Dallas. I literally ran to the Draft Goldwater Committee headquarters. And for two hours, I was in the eye of the storm, beset by reporters, because I was the press representative, beset by reporters, threatened by angry citizens who were banging literally on our doors, saying, murderers, murderers. There was even a bomb threat. We had to call the police. They did a search and could not find any, any bomb. During all this period of some two hours after the assassination, I was wondering, along with everybody else in America, who had done it. Perhaps it was somebody from our side. After all, TV anchors kept pointing out that Kennedy had been killed in Dallas, the heart of Goldwater land. And then came the dramatic announcement that someone with the Fair Play for a Cuba committee had been arrested, and relief flooded me from top to bottom. And as every good anti-communist knew, the Fair Play for Cuba committee was a pro-Castro, pro-communist think tank for Cuba. Praise the Lord, I cried. It's not one of ours, it's one of theirs. Notwithstanding that horrific event, Barry Goldwater declared that he would be a candidate, knowing, and remark this on a politician, knowing in almost all likelihood he could not win, could not win. Uh, we, did, we took some polls, and they showed that Barry Goldwater running against Lyndon Johnson, who was succeeded, uh, Mr. Kennedy, President Kennedy. We got 20%, and Johnson got 80%. This is in January of that year. So Barry Goldwater knew he could not win, and yet he still said, I will raise the standard. I will run for the nomination. I will provide what he called a conservative choice and not a liberal echo. I'll never forget my first formal meeting with the senator as his director of information. That's what I was called. By the way, I, I got the job even though I was much too young and much too inexperienced. Well, how did I get the job? Well, the first choice, a seasoned veteran, had a heart attack and had to resign. The second choice turned out to be an alcoholic, and he was forced to resign. So the campaign manager looked around and said, well, we're left and stuck with Lee Edwards. We're just gonna have to do the best we can. So I was so excited about this opportunity, because I love Barry Goldwater, who was our champion, our hero. So I put together this comprehensive public relations campaign, detailing his positions on the issues, but also wartime experience as a pilot, his handmade ham radio, the electronic flagpole in the front of his house, which went up and down depending upon dawn and dusk, his journey down the dangerous Colorado River in a wooden boat, his flying food and supplies to snowed in Navajos, who might very well have starved without Barry Goldwater's help, his membership in both the NAACP and the Urban League of Phoenix. Well, I had barely begun my presentation on fire when the president stuck out, the senator stuck out his big right hand and said, Lee, stop. If you try any of that Madison Avenue crap in my campaign, I'll throw your rear end out of this campaign. Except he didn't say rear end. 
this will be a campaign of principles, not of personalities. Understood? And of course, you know, he was a major general, I was a corporal, so I saluted. But he was dead wrong. Because if we had been allowed to present his human side, it would have dispelled at least some of the public fears about Goldwater as a warmonger and destroyer of social security. The next 10 months, as they always do in the campaign, were like a roller coaster moving so quickly. And I just want to share with you one event in the last week of that campaign. A group of prominent California uh, Republicans had bought time on NBC for a television address by Ronald Reagan, endorsing Goldwater. A day before the broadcast, an embarrassed Goldwater called Reagan, say, well, uh, my campaign's concerned because about the content of your speech, Ronnie, um, especially because you're bringing up Social Security and we'd put that behind us and um, we want to put something else and run it as a substitute. And Reagan said, well, golly, you know, I've been given this speech and it's worked very well and, um, and I can't, it's up to me to, to take it off or not. You have to talk to the people who had bought the time. And he said, Reagan said to go, well, have you listened to it or heard it? He said, no, I haven't, so I'm going to. So they played an audio tape of A Time for Choosing for Barry Goldwater. And at the end of it, Goldwater looked up and said, well, what the hell's wrong with that? And he gave his approval. And his approval enabled Ronald Reagan to give a speech which made him a national political star overnight, raised millions of dollars, changed thousands of votes, and it led to those same prominent Republicans going to Ronald Reagan the following year and saying, please run for governor of California. The Goldwater campaign has been called a glorious disaster, and certainly he lost. He only carried six states, only won 38.5% of the popular vote, but what were the positives coming out of it? He broke the Democratic hold on the solid South, enabling, because five of those six states were deep South states, enabling the Republican Party to become much more of a national party and beginning to undercut that Democratic advantage which they had in the South. For the first time in national politics, Goldwater discussed third rail issues, social security, government subsidies, privatization, and victory over communism. Certainly we can say, in short, that Barry Goldwater was the most consequential loser in modern politics. Ronald Reagan. I first met Ronald Reagan, that's in uh, the mid-October of 1965. My wife, Ann, and I spent two days on the road with him as whether he was considering whether to run for governor of California, and I was working on a profile of Reagan for Reader's Digest. Believe it or not, there were just four of us in the limo. The driver, Ann, in the front seat, me in the back seat, and Reagan over here. No, no advanced people, that was it, just the four of us. So for two days, we traveled with Ronald Reagan as he gave speeches to Rotary, Kiwanis, Republican women, businessmen, and so forth. And we saw women in Armani and Tiffany melt when he looked at them. We saw blasé business leaders jump to their feet when he got through talking. We saw old Pauls nudge each other and not approvingly at his polished performance. We saw little old ladies in tennis shoes from Orange County um, line up to shake his hand. He had the unmistakable aura of a cigar. At the end of the first day back in our motel, Ann and I, who had worked in New York politics at a very young age, we looked at each other, we both said at the same time, he's got it. At the end of that second day, Reagan said, we've been working very hard. Let's go up to the house and have iced tea and cookies. Sure, so it went up Pacific Palisades overlooking Hollywood. Mm -hmm. He and Nancy went into the kitchen to do the iced tea and cookies, and they put us in the library study, very small one, and I looked over, and there facing me 
were shelves filled with books, top to bottom, filled with books. Hmm. Books. So I went over. What kind of books were they? Books on economics, history, politics. And I thought to myself, this is extraordinary. I, th I thought this was some kind of you know, B-film actor that only said what people gave him to, to say. Could this possibly be something different? And what were the titles? F. F. A. Hayek's The Road to Serfdom, which is a classic of economic literature. Hayek was a Nobel laureate. Whitaker Chambers' Witness, one of the great stories of anti-communism uh, there. Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson, classic, and a book I had never read, that I had not read, Frederick Bastiat's The Law. And Bastiat was a 19th century free market French economist. Well, I thought, well, okay, maybe there, did he really read them? I was just looking, there were the titles, so I reached over, you know, and Anne's like, no, don't, don't do that. Nancy will come in and see, looking, and oh, it's okay, it's all right. So I pulled out a book and opened it, dog-eared, underlined, notes in the margin. And I did that with several of those books. This is a secret which I discovered about Ronald Reagan in 1965, unknown to his movie and TV fans. He was an intellectual truly an intellectual, comfortable with ideas and understanding the power of ideas. Here was the personal library of a thinking, reasoning person who had arrived at his philosophy the old-fashioned way, one book at a time. That night I wrote in my notebook, President Reagan, question mark. Well, when I wrote a biography two years later, which was the first biography of Ronald Reagan, I took out the question mark. <laughs> and I predicted that he would be president one day in 1967. Now, I gotta be honest with you. I'm not always right, not, I'm not, but I got that one right, and I will take credit for it. Reagan was many things as we know, and one of the things I thought I might just emphasize here for you all is that uh, the way he used humor. The day he was shot, um, when they, as they were wheeling him into the operating room, he looked over, sort of lifted up his head. I mean, imagine here, he'd take him in for the operation. He lost all this blood and he's still raising, looks over and there is Jim Baker, Ed Meese, and Mike Deaver, his three top White House aides, lined up against the, the wall with these long faces. And he said, hey, who's minding the store? Trying to reassure someone else that he was okay. He used humor also at his meetings with Mikhail Gorbachev, telling all of these stories, always with a point though. There's one story which he liked to tell. It's about the American and the Russian, and they were arguing about the freedom in their country. Now keep in mind, this is Reagan telling this story to Gorbachev. The American said, look, I can go into the Oval Office, pound the president's desk, and say, Mr. President, I don't like the way you're running the country. The Russian said, well, I can do that too. You can, the American said. The Russian said, yes, I can go into the Kremlin, into the General Secretary's office, and say, Mr. General Secretary, I don't like the way that President Reagan is running his country. I think in these days when we're always focusing on what's happening in Washington, D.C., which is almost my hometown and where I worked for almost my whole life, um, to mention something that, that Reagan really believed in, that was the 70% rule, 70% rule. It's what he called the politics of prudence. He would say that I, if I can get 70% of what I want, I would take my chances of getting the other 30% later. And for example, 
he pushed for a 30% tax cut in his 1981 reform plan, but settled for 23%, 30 down to 23. Uh, okay, but what about the other 30%? Five years later, with his Tax Reform Act of 1986, he got the other 30% of what he wanted by reducing the 14 personal tax brackets to three, eliminating most special deductions and preferences, so-called loopholes, and cutting the corporate tax rate. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a little bit more of that 70% kind of attitude in Washington today? He was a master of the one-liner, and we know, and I can personally attest, that that was something that <laughs> these were his own one-liners. In, um, in December of uh, 1981, I had revised and updated my third version of the Reagan biography, and I wanted to present it to the president. Now, my publisher, had insisted, and I went along with that, including my including a chapter about the assassination attempt. I said, fine. But then on the cover, he added complete, and this is in bold black on bright yellow, complete through the assassination attempt. I don't, I don't really don't like that. I mean, that's, it's, it's tacky at best, but I mean, it really, he said, no, no, this is going to be good for sales. And we fought back and forth. And he insisted, so the publisher, you know, usually prevails over the author, complete through the assassination attempt. So I called Mike Deaver. He says, I'd like to present. He said, fine, come on in. The Oval Office will do that. So I walk in, and there's this wonderful president looking so great just a, seven months after being nearly killed. Big smile shake hands, we're talking a little bit, and he looks down and looks, take us the first time, a good look at the cover, which says, complete through the assassination attempt. And he lifts up his head, he says, well, Lee, I'm sorry I messed up your ending. <laughs> you know, only Reagan could make a joke out of it, his, his death or near death. All of these people I've been talking about, whether it's Ronald Reagan or Barry Goldwater or others, had a deep love of liberty and an equally deep hostility to its principal enemy for most of the 20th century, communism. And that's how I joined the conservative movement, was as an anti-communist. I was in Paris in 1956, October, as a student, and of course, what happened in October 1956 was the Hungarian Revolution. And that was being beamed in by radio and newspapers and so forth to Paris. And I was just ecstatic. I mean, I was just so filled with happiness and joy for these young men and women who had stood up against the communists and had said, get out of our country. And they did for two weeks. And they came back in with their tanks and their troops, and they killed thousands of young men and women my age, causing hundreds of thousands of Hungarians to flee the country and instituting once again a Soviet tyranny and oppression. I was furious. I was embarrassed, but I was furious. Angry, why, what, what, why didn't my country do more to help these freedom fighters in Hungary? And I resolved at that point that for the rest of my life I would do whatever I could to support those who resisted communism and pursued liberty. And that's why we started the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, of which I'm chairman. It's why we built the first memorial to all those victims, 100 million victims of communism, uh, on Capitol Hill, just a couple of blocks from Union Station and the Capitol building itself. Anti-communism. That brings us to Richard Nixon, doesn't it? This man of such, of all these contradictions, profound 
and profane, a politician, but also a statesman, a brilliant and boneheaded. We were talking at, uh, at dinner, well, here's an example of his boneheadedness. In 1960, when he was running against uh, John Kennedy, Mr. Nixon said, and he pledged publicly, I am going to visit all 50 states. Maybe some of you may remember that, that pledge. It was a very foolish pledge because what happened in the last week of the campaign when things were so tight, remember how close the election was? Mr. Nixon got on a plane and flew to Anchorage. S gave a five minute talk and then flew back from Anchorage, losing almost a full day. If he had been campaigning in a place like Illinois, which he narrowly lost, or Texas, which he narrowly lost, who knows what the outcome might have been. So this is an example, as I say, of his boneheadedness. But more importantly was um, his role in the Alger Hiss Whitaker Chambers case. Now for our younger people in attendance here, uh, Alger Hiss um, was the golden boy of the liberal establishment. Um, Whitaker Chambers was a senior editor at Time Magazine and he turned Washington upside down by saying that Alger Hiss was a communist and had been a member of the same spy ring that he, Whitaker Chambers, had been a member of. Just galvanized Washington, D.C. And there was a public confrontation between these two men. Alger Hiss, tall, slender, Brooks Brothers suits, polished shoes, calm, confident, even arrogant. Whitaker Chambers, overweight, plump, slovenly, bad teeth, uh, mumbled. Who are you going to believe? You know, who was telling the truth here? Because Hiss said, I was not a, never a communist, not, I don't even know who this man is. I just think, if Chambers was lying and Hiss was telling the truth. What did that do to the idea of anti-communism? Maybe not only a, a serious blow, perhaps a fatal blow. On the other hand, if Chambers was telling the truth and Hiss was lying, this would be an enormous victory for the cause of anti-communism. Anti-communism ladies and gentlemen, was the, the glue which kept the conservative movement together all during the Cold War years. Without it, there might not have even been a conservative movement in America during the Cold War years. And there was one man who smelled something here and said, wait a minute now, um, Mr. Hiss is too smooth. Now, all of this is going on before the House Committee on American activities, a congressional hearing. And Mr. Nixon said there was just something a little too smooth and evasive about some of his, and they're too calculated. There's, I th may very well be that Chambers is telling the truth. And his, this golden boy of a liberal establishment, was a spy <laughs> for the Soviets. And that's the way it turned out to be. And in that particular contribution of Richard Nixon's to politics, to the conservative movement, was never forgotten by conservatives for the rest of his life. And it's one of the reasons why when occasionally Mr. Nixon would do something on the policy side, which didn't please conservatives, they would always say, well, but he put Alger Hiss in jail. 1960 convention. It's the one at which uh, Nixon had already made a deal with Nelson Rockefeller and with Barry Goldwater on getting the nomination. So the only question was his, vote, his running mate. Nixon had pitched, picked Henry Cabot Lodge. Again, a tall, handsome, good-looking guy, well-known former senator from Massachusetts, had been the ambassador to the United Nations. 
looked to be a good choice. But the keynote address given was by a man named Walter Judd, a congressman from Minnesota. And it was a, just a, an old fashioned stem winder, just fantastic. Just galvanized and, and stampeded the convention. And they began holding up signs saying, Judd for vice president, Walter Judd for vice veep. And Nixon had to acknowledge that. And so he called Dr. Judd over to his suite and said, now Walter, and they knew each other, they'd been congressmen together uh, during the 40s and early 50s. Walter, uh, down to either you or, or Cabot, what do you think? How do you see it? Well, Dr. Judd was a, was a physician, trained a scientist, tried to be objective. And so he said all the good things about, about Cabot and some of the negatives about himself. He was in his early 60s. Uh, he had had face cancer under control, but it made his face all wrinkled. He said, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it might be better to have Cabot. And Nixon said, OK, that's it. Uh, will you nominate Cabot? Yes, I will. Well, think about this. Going back to that 60 election, those two close margins in Illinois and Texas, so happens that Walter Judd had campaigned in both of those states for years, was well known, well regarded, well liked. Is it possible that if Nixon had picked Dr. Judd and that Cabot Lodge, could he have won that very narrow election? Well, guess who thought that might very well be the case? Richard Nixon, because two years later, after Dr. Judd had retired from Congress, actually had been defeated, uh, gerrymandered, and of course, Mr. Nixon uh, lost the election. He bumped into Dr. Judd and he said, Walter, he said, if I had picked you instead of Cabot, we'd both still be in Washington, D.C. So this is the kind of thing on which politics turn. Also in that 60 campaign, the press, and this is where Jonathan made reference to my father. My father was a journalist, a reporter for the Chicago Tribune for almost 50 years. He covered every president from FDR to Nixon. He covered every national convention. He also went out campaigning, and he was there on the campaign trail with first Nixon and then with, um, with Kennedy. And he was there for the first debate. Remember the first debate? And some of you may remember the first debate. And um, we didn't, didn't know, you know how was Kennedy going to do, what about Nixon, so forth. Well, the, there were so many people in the press corps that they couldn't put him in the same room with the candidates and the platform. So they put him in a separate room. They could watch everything on television. That meant nobody was watching the press and they could pretty much do whatever they wanted to do, right? Like, so the debate began, and my father, who was pro-Nixon, as was his paper, somebody would, uh, would look up, and there was, Kennedy had scored a point, a debate point, against Nixon, and the, all the reporters were applauding, literally applauding. On another occasion, when it was a particular telling point, a reporter leaped to his feet and said, give it to him, Jack. So when this is all over and the campaign was all over, my father wrote a piece called, Is the Press Prejudiced? <laughs> is the Press Prejudiced? And he was the, you know, the political expert uh, for the Chicago Tribune. He went to the Tribune and they said, I'm sorry, we can't publish it. Well, why not? Well, we don't wash our dirty linen in public. So my father went to a conservative publication with which some of you may be familiar, perhaps you were subscribed to it in the past, Human Events. And Human Events published it. And you can go to that and, and read the article. It's quite a revealing one. And Nixon read it, liked it, invited my, my father, and they began even, an even closer relationship. 
because of that article. I had the occasion to um, be on the receiving end of uh, Richard Nixon's brilliance uh, close up uh, twice. It was 1966 and he was courting uh, conservatives. He was beginning working through Pat Buchanan to reach out to young conservatives. And I was invited twice in that year to a presentation, those famous presentations by Richard Nixon in which he would look at the world and do what he called a tour d'horizon and begin talking about the various leaders of the various countries, continents, the interrelationship between them and so forth. And he did this, as I say, twice when I heard him, and they were not the same, by the way, without a note, without a single note, just standing up there and talking about the world and the relationships. Just extraordinary, just extraordinary. Finally, uh, Watergate, uh, 1974. In the early spring of that year, I was busy with my firm when Rabbi Baruch Korf came calling. Anybody remember Rabbi Korf? Rabbi Korf was, had formed a, th a committee called the Committee for Fairness to the Presidency. And he said, came to me and said, I need your help. He said, I need you to raise m funds for me. <laughs> he said, I have no money. Uh, I don't know how to raise funds. You can. He begged, he pleaded, he argued, he refused to take no for an answer. And so finally I succumbed to Rabbi Korf, who said he was a descendant of the first famous Rabbi Hillel. And I wound up raising $100,000 for his committee, pro bono, and um, was able to underwrite the rally, a book, other conferences, other things, but as we know, to no avail. To show his gratitude, the rabbi took me to the White House for a meeting with the president. And Rabbi Korf introduced me by name to, Mr. to the president. He said, shook his head, he said, why, I practically raised Lee. <laughs> but he knew my name. And as a matter of fact, he, uh, he looked at me and he said, well, how's Anne? He remembered my wife's first name. And I think, you know, we had met once, you know years before. How's Ann? Remarkable memory, remarkable man, somebody who has made a difference in our politics, in our nation, and I'm so pleased I had an opportunity to visit the museum. I applaud Jonathan and all the wonderful things that you're doing. This is a first-class presidential library, and I've been to almost every one of them, and I'm, I'm really pleased to have been, I'm, and I'm going to come back. <laughs> I'm definitely going to come back. So those are some of the giants that I've had the privilege and the honor to work with over the years. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Lee's agreed to answer your questions. Before he does, I just want to announce again, that he'll be available in the lobby to, to sign your copy of Just Right. Um, I'd like to start off by asking, uh, what is the um, future of the conservative movement? Um, I mean that in the sense that many people don't think that President Trump um, <clears throat> exemplifies conservative values, and there's friction between him and many of the people in the leaders in the Republican Party, especially uh, those in Congress. Right. What is, what is the future of the conservative movement? And I've written about this, and um, if you want, you can go to Heritage, and you'll see some of my longer comments about it. But the short version is that. Uh, in a sense, the movement is stronger, deeper, broader than it's ever been. It has assets it's never had. It has financing it's never had. It has youth groups working and training and educating young people. There are 60 state think tanks which are promoting free market ideas in our states. Uh, the Heritage Foundation is just one of a of, a, of many, many think tanks with a budget of $100 million a year and 300 employees. And we have the right ideas, ladies and gentlemen. We have the right ideas, which go back 
not just in the last 50 or 60 years to people like F.A. Hayek and Russell Kirk, but to Western civilization going back 2,000 years, 2,500 years. What we don't have, what we don't have is the right kind of leadership to bring together all these disparate elements of the movement. And until we have that kind of charismatic, principled leadership, uh, we're going to see some rough going. I'm calling, and I have called for what's called a new fusionism, which is to bring together all these various disparate conservatives. I think it can be done. It's been done in the past, but it needs the right leadership. We have a question right here. Thank you for your very nice presentation. My name is Larry Polikoff, Fullerton, California. My question is, what do you think about the accusation of fake news mm. and has a spin that the press is putting on things violated the eth ethics, I think, of the First Amendment? Yeah. Well, a couple of things. Um, must I say, my father was a reporter for 50 years. And um, he was always very careful about, about what he wrote and what was published. And he wasn't in a hurry to get it first. He wanted to get it right. He wanted to get it correct. And there are too many reporters today who are driven by this idea, we must get it first, we must go for ratings, we must go for audiences, and to, to, if, if it's a little bit, just a little bit off or very much off, that's okay. We've got to keep moving ahead. And I've, ha I've heard uh, several reporters tell me this. I'd say, well, why did you go with this story? And he said, because the other guys went with it, and therefore we were driven to go with it as well. Uh, the First Amendment is there. Why? Why did the founders institute the First Amendment? It was to provide information to the public so that they could make informed decisions about their government. Secondly, it was there, the First Amendment, to go after instances of malfeasance and graft and corruption in the government. But the idea that it's there for reporters to get become famous and write bestsellers and get invited to Georgetown uh, parties and to get on radio and television and posture about how much they know and they know so very little. Uh, it's a long, long ways away from what the founders had in mind when they passed the First Amendment 241 years ago. We have a question right here. Yes, I, with Reagan, Nixon, California, conservatism, <laughs> What is going on, and how is it that the conservatives and the Republicans have written off the most populous state in the, in the nation? Yeah. And do you have any thoughts on possibly running and reinvigorating, getting a personality of yeah. a type of Regan? And I'm thinking Larry Elder, mm -hmm. black, conservative, mm -hmm. dynamic, and I think it would be a perfect right. choice. Well, I think, again, I think the, the answer is, is there in, in your question, and that is the role, the absolute necessary necessity of leadership. And if you don't have leaders who are willing to take the right ideas and implement them and use them and inspire other people with them, you're not going to have progress. So I think you're absolutely right that we need some kind of, here in California, some kind of special personality but who has got, at the same time, has got brains and a philosophy and some grounding, which, as you, as you well know, uh, Larry Elder has. I, mean, I don't know whether it's he or not, but somebody like that. Um, I campaigned out here in 1964 for Barry Goldwater in a very critical Republican primary against Nelson Rockefeller. And at that point, our base of support was L.A. County, which was about 75% conservative and Orange County, which is about 85% conservative. And I know that um, Knott's Berry Farm is still here, but I don't think Orange County is 85% conservative. Uh, so things have changed, uh, but we can't just write off California. I mean, it's just, it's just, that's just silly. You can't write off, or 
New York for that matter. I mean, there are possibilities there as well. And even if you can begin to start reducing that margin, so it's not a 20 or 30 percent, or I mean 20 or 30 point difference, that can make a difference and people are running at lower offices. So uh, there's, there's work to be done there and I hope uh, that uh, they'll take counsel from it and do something about it. They've got to. We have a question in the back row. Thank you. Uh, you, you indicated that you, you started out, your first interests were the anti-communism uh, situation. Same thing with uh, Mr. Nixon. And in all of the years since then, communism has been to a certain extent you know, discredited or I think around the world and other, other things, other forces or threats or whatnot are, are out there. Um, what do you think the conservative movement should be focusing on right now? Mm -hmm. uh, still communism or, or right. uh, what other, right. what are the main things in 2017 that we should be thinking about? Right. Well, one of the things that brings people together is, is an outside threat. And I think we have an outside threat and we have an inside threat. The outside threat is uh, radical jihadism. I mean, they, do, they, they want to kill us. They want to destroy us. They want to blow us up. Because I live in Washington, D.C., I'm very conscious of it. I drove by the Pentagon the morning it was hit and the smoke was rising from the Pentagon. And that's why I wear this flag in my lapel, because I'm not going to forget what happened on 9-11. Heritage did a study recently in which there were something like almost 100 terrorist acts which have been prevented since 9-11 uh, since by certain measures which we have taken. Who knows how many people would have been injured or harmed or murdered or died in that in those terrorist acts. That threat is still there, and too many Americans, in my view, are taking it for granted that it's always going to be this safe. The internal threat, the inside threat, is socialism. Um, it's notwithstanding the work which is being done by various youth groups with which I do try to, to help any way I can. Uh, socialism is becoming more and more acceptable to more and more young people, particularly. And we've got to do a better job of telling them that socialism don't, doesn't work. It takes away private property. It takes away God. It takes away the individual. Just ask the next per young person who says, oh, you know, I'm a socialist. Well, are, are you okay with not having private property anymore? Are you okay with not having God in your life? Are you okay with not worrying about yourself as an individual? Get them to start thinking about what really is involved in the reality of, of socialism. Thank you, Lee. Please give Lee Edwards a round of applause. Thank you.